camera or look at you? You can look at me. That's okay. fine. Um, I'm very excited to be sitting here with you. I, I saw recently a press pre preview of the new black, which just blew my mind, uh, quite frankly, because I had just come back from Sundance where the case against the eight was uh, won the director's award and uh, was it's a very good, well-directed uh, documentary on the gestation of the Supreme Court, which we won. But so, but what is absent in that film are practically any person of color. One person flickers across the screen, which is not to say that it, that it was intentional, but that the sort of David Mixner politic. David Mixner was the head of Mikla, which was the LA-based um, moneyed gay and lesbian um, political group. It was called Checkbook D D Democracy. And they very much bargained in the back room, power broking, and leaving out the people that didn't have the funds to put, write the checks. And so when the, the Supreme, when the, the referendum happened in Los, in California, and we lost, there was a lot of finger pointing at the black community for they were the reason that it lost, and particularly black women were called. And um, thank you. You open your film. By the way, let me let me first let me, you introduce yourself, and so that um, all of our audience knows exactly who you are and why we're sitting here. Absolutely. Uh, my name is Yoruba Richin, and I'm a documentary filmmaker. Um, I am the director, producer, writer of the film The New Black. Uh, which opens at Film Forum this week. And you're a graduate of Brown University. Of Brown University. And yeah. you grew up? I grew up in New York, in Harlem. Um, in in Harlem Brooklyn. before the, the new regentrification? Oh, course. absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. And you got to Brown, which is one of the best uh, universities in, in the country. Um, all right, let's go back to what, where, where, where I was starting. Sure. The, um, there's a lot of finger pointing. Particularly, but and you have Robin Tyler at the very beginning of your film, who is sort of represents that point of view. It's interesting that it's a lesbian that's doing it because the the breakdown in all of the battles previously had been between the down the downstate Los Angeles-based power brokers, mostly gay men, uh, some women, but mostly gay men, and the ups, upstate grassroots organizing door-to-door -door of the lesbian community. So you had Robin sort of subtly but pointedly uh, saying she hopes that the black community will get its act together next time. Had you, were you aware of that kind of controversy? Jim, you totally hit, hit it on the head and basically sort of summarize the reason why I did this, why I made this film. I was actually in California the night of 2008, the election um, of Barack Obama and the uh, passage of Proposition 8. And um, I was, you know, the, as many of us had, the sort of elation um, at our first African-American president and also this terrible defeat of Proposition 8. And what was so weird is that after, right after that, immediately after that, I mean, I was, you know, listening to the radio and watching the news all the next day, African Americans, as you said, started, they started blaming African Americans for its passage. Um, it was based on that erroneous poll that said that 70%, it was like an exit poll of blacks voted, you know, for, uh, for, the, for the referendum, and that turned out to be false, but the narrative took hold. What were the actual figures on that? I think it was something like around 52, 53, That's and if you look difference. at, yeah, and if you look at what other groups voted, how other groups voted, it was pretty much in line. Okay. Um, if you look at like how the religious people voted and um, so, you know, but I began to, you know, I'm a documentary filmmaker, so I, I started questioning why is this happening? Why are black and LGBT folks being pitted against each other? And There's what that very was about. angry black, gay and lesbian voices responded. Absolutely. And we didn't hear those voices in the mainstream media. We didn't hear the black LGBT voices. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to look at uh, my initial sort of uh, motivation in, in making this film is, I, if you remember at that time, we thought that it was going to, they were going to try to put another referendum to reverse it in 2010. So I began looking at um, 
how these two groups were trying to work together, what those fris the, what those frisures were, and how they were trying to work together. So I started following some people, some activists in the community in California, in California, and also nationally. Because okay. the other thing is Mandy Carter involved in any of this? Absolutely, she's one of the first people I met. Um, uh, the other thing is, I had a sense that this was going, this was now bubbling up to the top of the political agenda. And this had become sort of the de the facto. Wedge, the wedge issue. Yes, the wedge issue. And this uh, marriage equality movement had become the kind of de facto, you know, gay gay rights issue. Now that we could die in the military. Exactly. We which, moved to marriage. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, which, you know, uh, obviously was a con is, a con is still a controversial thing, but that that's where we mm -hmm. were politically. A basic civil right. Exactly. So I um, started following activists who were trying to repair this relationship, looking into why this was happening, and I happened upon Sharon uh, Letman Hicks, and she was, and I actually met her, I believe, through Mandy Carter. I met them all at the same time. Um, you black women know each other, huh? Well, no, I didn't know them, actually. I, I was actually at Creating Change, uh -huh. um, the big LGBT conference, and I was doing research. And, I, and you know, I met Mandy, I met Sharon, and I thought Sharon was so interesting because she um, had left the sort of civil rights, traditional civil rights, voting rights, um, you know, work, and decided after her experience with Prop 8, which mirrored mine, to work for on LGBT black LGBT issues and she you know she says in the film this is the unfinished business of black people being free she sees this as a um, you know a civil rights issue especially for African Americans which we don't often hear about um, so I thought she was a really interesting character and one of the and the work that she was doing was uh, you know, was was exactly the kind of stuff I was looking for. And one of the things her projects was looking at homophobia in the black church. So she, um, through her and her organizing, I started looking at that lens of homophobia in the black church. So not only what sort of white LGBT folks weren't doing, but within our own community, what was going on. What's really interesting to me is that you really do leave that argument aside. It's not about, in your film, dealing with what the white whatever criticisms of the white organizing of that part of the movement, you really look to the black experience, both allies and, you know, just the black community. Right. And I thought that that was such a smart move on your part not to get into the other sinkhole. And I had started, as I said, I thought it, the film would be more about that, but where the story took me is that's where it led me. Mm -hmm. And that's because of the work of Sharon, and then, of course, the politics kept... It kept unfolding over these past few years, you know, so... Explain a little bit more who Sharon actually is. Sure. So Sharon Letman Hicks, she's uh, one of the protagonists in the film, and she runs the National Black Justice Coalition, which is the leading African-American, LGBT-focused uh, advocacy policy organization. Um, and, you know, she comes which from... Which has always had problems with funding. Right. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, that's, yeah, getting into the weeds of it. But she's really, I think, elevated this organization in a big way in the last couple of years. And part of it is because of her, you know, because of the politics that have happened. You know, I think when Washington, D.C. passed marriage, mm -hmm. and that was the first time that you had, that you really started seeing black people uh, being spokespersons, you know. Uh, because they live there. They're right, because they live there, exactly. And, um, and, you know, taking on a more leadership role. Mm -hmm. And then it came to Maryland. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sharon lives in Maryland. So the story uh, began once Maryland passed the, uh, the, the bill, the marriage equality bill, and the other side, the um, anti-gay marriage folks, got enough uh, votes, uh, to, yeah, enough yeah, signatures, signatures to put it on the referendum. Then the story became about this battle in Maryland. And Maryland had you know, has about 30% African-American population um, of and significant... And how does that break down in class? You know, I don't know the because answer to that, but... there's a large middle class. There's an uh, upper class. Yeah. There's a very large upper class, and uh, we have Samantha Master in the film talks about that. Prince George's County is one of the wealthiest black communities in the country. Which I had never heard of. Yeah, exactly. Interestingly yeah, enough. One of the wealthiest black communities in the country. And then, of course, you have Baltimore. 
So you have a range. So there's a big class range mm -hmm. in, um, in Maryland, and there's also a big church community mm -hmm. as well. So kind of all the different pieces that I was, you know, uncovering came together in Maryland. Let's step back for a moment. You did a film about South Africa mm -hmm. post-apartheid. Yeah. Yes. Um, how did that inform your sort of consciousness or t the way you looked at this issue as it, the storytelling was developing? Absolutely. I mean, I am someone, as I said, I grew up in, in Harlem. Um, for many years, I went to school on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. I had two very like different experiences growing up. You were up. one of the black kids that went to the all whites private Absolutely. school? In the 80s, it? when yeah. no one was talking yeah, about okay. that. Like, now there's <laughs> films about it. Now there's, in the 80s, no one was talking about that. And you're and grateful also, for that experience. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, it's, it shaped how I see things. And and, you know, there also, I don't know if you remember that dividing line of 96th Street, which was very, very stark. Uh, it's less so now um, because more white, wealthy people because are moving of, uptown. Because of Bloomberg. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that dividing line, and that was a very sort of visceral thing of seeing that dividing line, uh, taking the bus to school every day. So I say all the that. Central Park Five. Yeah, I mean, of course, all of that, the racially polarized time, you know, uh, those racially polarized times in the, in the 80s. And I say all that because it really shaped how I sort of understood uh, our society and inequity and who gets a voice and who doesn't. And so that's what's, what's dr drove me and what's driven me in terms of my work. So in South Africa, which was always a country I'd been, you know, very interested in, I, I, we went to see when Nelson Mandela was released and spoke up at Yankee Stadium. We walked, you know, from the house and went to see him. Um, so I'd always been obsessed with South Africa. And uh, looking at this land issue at the end of apartheid, now that you know that legal protections had been given, how was it actually happening? How are the resources mm -hmm. being doled out? And who were the people that were, you know, the how are the white former landowners fair, you know, dealing with this? I was very interested in that. Um, so, and also, as I think, as you see with the new black, I'm also interested in the the other side as well. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not interested in telling just one side of the story, I think adding the, you know, I think it adds complexity to try to understand, you know, and that's where you get at some kind of truth, where you understand both sides. What's really interesting to me is that you give dignity to the opposition. Uh, I can't remember his name, but that one particular... Derek McCoy, one, yes, yeah. um, You don't treat him like a pariah. You don't treat him... Um, you let, you let us make our own judgments and try to figure out just why he's so committed to this. So let's talk a little bit about the role of religion mm -hmm. and money in the, in the battlefield of Maryland. Absolutely. So in terms of religion, I think that, as I said, Maryland has an active black church community, very powerful black church community. Across all class lines. Yes, absolutely. And they, and I think... The, there were organizing lessons learned from California, especially, that you had to engage the black church if you... With black people. Yes, with black people, absolutely. And not just the black church, but in, yeah. in, in Maryland, it was very concerted effort to engage the black church. And um, what you started to see in Maryland is that, yes, there was opposition. The, the, the leader um, was a black minister. The leader of the opposition was a black minister. However, more and more ministers started to come out in favor of the bill. And some, did any of them come out? We know that the black church is going to be a closet. I don't know if they've, they've, if they've come out, if any of them come out yet uh, in terms of the ministers, but you had more and more uh, support. Mm -hmm. I mean, you see that. Uh, now, was that more of a, 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 not the evangelical ministers, but It the, was more the traditional black Baptist ministers, mm -hmm. um, oh, Baptist. you know, yeah, yeah but the, the traditional black Baptist ministers, you know, from traditional black Baptist church mm -hmm. churches. And of course, as you just pointed out, we have a range of different kinds of churches in our community. But I'm talking about the traditional black yes, okay. church. So like in the film, Reverend Coates, who uh, start, you know came, comes out very forcefully? He was he thoughtful a, man. Yeah, he's great. He's actually on the ballot for lieutenant governor now. He was picked as a uh, for to, as a running mate. Um, you know, he has a traditional. He says a traditional Baptist church of eight thousand people, and he made the stand to not be silent and to come out. And uh, and other ministers there did too. And people say that that caused a big uh, uh, turnaround uh, yeah. in the. In the community. Let's talk about black women for a moment. You know, the criticism out of California was that black women, uh, young black women, voted against marriage equality because they were afraid that their men were, what men were left 
because of the imprisonment, the right. whole, the, all the, the, the economic and class differences, that men were being stolen from them right. by gay and lesbian people, or, or women were being stolen. And so you have that sort of template, whether it's true or not, I mean, you could comment on, but you have that sort of template of black women also really holding the power in the churches and in the community. And how that issue, you have that wonderful sort of uh, upper class uh, barbecue where the women are talking very frankly and you get a diversity of opinion. Absolutely. Can you talk a little bit about the role of sure. black women? Um, I think that, first off I'll say, it's funny that that was criticism in California because the polls show in Maryland that black women supported it slightly more than black men. Um, so, you know, I think that... You think that's because of the prison experience? I think that in terms of the... the black men. The black men. I think that there's... I think there's a lot, and I tried to show it in the film. I think that you mentioned the, you know, how, um, you know, as you said, prison and, uh, you know, the... the masculinity. The masculinity. The... All these issues that we have to deal with and that we historically have to deal with. You know, it was important for me to put in the film that we weren't allowed to have a family. I mean, we weren't literally when we were brought here as slaves. And so the issue of family is a very fraught one in a lot of ways for mm -hmm. us. Um, and there are a lot of factors that contribute to, um, you know, to the breakup of the family. Um, you know, I, I don't think LGBT is one of them, but certainly it's important to understand the, the sort of historical forces that, um, you know, that, and as Derek McCoy says, he says, you know, what's our biggest issue? The family. And now they're trying to change it into something else. Um, I think that, uh, you know, issues of masculinity, of stru the structural forces that have historically destroyed our families um, are all very important. But I think that and this is Sharon's point, what she says, is she says, you know, no matter, she says it at the end of the film, she says, no matter what, uh, win or lose, at least a conversation has started to mm. understand that we are part of the mm. black family mm -hmm. and that this actually strengthens the family, um, doesn't destroy it, it actually strengthens the you black know, family. One of my favorite sequences in the film is when you go up to these four black young men. Yeah. You know, one, of course, is strutting like a stud with his shirt off, yeah. and the gay men in the audience are going to be very aware <laughs> of his sort of... And he's the most homophobic yeah. of the people. And they're, these are not the educated professionals. These right. are people on the stoop. Totally. And that, what happens in that scene between those four people is very much like the scene with the four women in the upper class yeah. barbecue lunch. And, the, and so... How did you get them to talk so frankly, they, openly? This is this is the beauty of documentary filmmaking. We followed Caress and Sam that day, um, and followed them canvassing, and that's who we found. We were canvassing in Baltimore, um, and the thing that it's my, one of my favorite scenes too. And the thing about the guy, the you know the guy who sort of changes their mind is that he was so smart. He was so knowledgeable about all the issues. Oh. And normally, I, I think it's so important to show, because normally they would be overlooked. They wouldn't be, they you were know. The they were yeah, Exactly. And these guys, like, broke it down. They understood. They were changed. They were debating. They were changing each other's minds. Um, and I think you see real sort of political change happening there. Mm -hmm. um, I, I love that scene, too. But we just found them. And that's, you know, that's documentary film. Was your crew all black? Uh, for the most part, yes. That, and I thought that was important. Uh, yeah. Just like two sides of Jasper. Exactly, yeah. yes. The crew was... I mean, I sometimes worked with, like, a white sound person, um, but pretty much the crew is all black. Because okay. uh, I knew we were going to be in these intimate spaces, you know? Let's talk about the funding of the anti-marriage uh, referendum in Maryland. Yeah. Who funded it? Well, you know... I have to say, I think both sides had outside money. Um, national Organization of Marriage, which is that national group, they definitely were part of the, the That's funding. That's the Mormon funded. No, it's not Mormon. That's evangelical. Okay. That's, um, you know, Maggie, whatever her name is. Oh, yes. Like, <laughs> yeah. Um, and they're evangelical group. They've done, and I think Brian, somebody is the, is the head of it. I don't think Maggie is there anymore. But anyway, um, so they were part of the fund, funding of it. Uh, but actually what I think is more important, because both sides got outside money, but is the strategy that was revealed. Mm -hmm. And that strategy, you know, that was revealed uh, in those documents that H Human Rights Campaign, you know, found that said our strategy, like literally on paper, our strategy is to divide blacks and gays. And that has been the strategy. It was right there on paper. Tell me how the first time you read that or knew of that, 
what how you felt about that well the first time that i understood how the started to understand how the religious right played a role in this was in talking to mandy carter actually mm -hmm. because she'd been involved in those battles in the 80s and she was the one who told me about what happened in cincinnati which we show in right. the film and to me i was like and i'm a kind of a political junkie and i didn't realize this and i was like wow this is this makes it even meatier mm -hmm. um i mean it's also the cynical politics of our nation um, that, you know, working, picking out a group even though you don't agree with them and you've worked against them on everything else, but to work with them on an anti-gay political agenda. But I thought that added another really interesting element. And then when it came out in Maryland, when we were filming, that <laughs> that's exactly what's still going on. I just thought it was really important to show that continuity of strategy that the religious right ha is doing. You know, there's a, my, the, probably the only scene that I really loved in 12 Years a Slave yeah. is, is Alfre Woodward when she's sitting having tea mm -hmm. and showing all, assuming all the privilege that she thinks she has, right. like a white person. Yeah. How does that affect the debate in the, in, in the society uh, across uh, class in Maryland? You know, I or don't. Does it? Yeah, I don't know in terms of um, in terms of that. I, I think that there. You know, I think if you. Yeah, I don't. I don't necessarily. I don't necessarily think that that's a factor in terms of kind of black people assuming white privilege on this issue. Um, you know, I think that I think these other factors that we just discussed okay. are sort of more. Okay. I just wanted to talk about what we what's in the news right now. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You know. Um, is it Michael Sam, mm -hmm. uh, a black NLF potential and NFL? Draft. NFL. You can tell that I'm not <laughs> the gay boy with the football. I've turned to my lesbian friend for yeah. that. But but the fact that here's a black athlete who openly, without much concern, yeah. says he's gay. What kind of reverberations do you think that has among young people and among older people in the black community? So I think this is so interesting because. It's not only Michael Salmon. First off, I think it's great that he came out before the draft pick because mm -hmm. he's saying, if you don't want me because I'm gay, don't take me. Like mm -hmm. that's, and I think that is so powerful. I think that it's also interesting that I would say that most of the athletes that have come out have been black. Yes. And I think that that is because if you look at our history in sports and what we had in terms of integration, in terms of, you know, um, trying to get ahead within the sports, you know, world, we've had to deal with a lot. And I think that that these athletes see that being black as part of and being gay as part of that, you know, freedom struggle and have come out. I think it's really, really interesting. And I, I, you know, I'm not in the sports world necessarily. Uh, my, my girlfriend is a football fan. But, you know, having black athletes come out, I mean, this is the next level. In fact, Caress, who's in the film, she is now working in sports management. She's at, I'm sorry, in, at Columbia for sports management. She's getting her degree okay. because she sees it as the next frontier okay. for LGBT issues. Um, well, it's the seat of homophobia. It's exactly. like the military. This yeah. is the seat of homophobia. Totally. So, I mean, this is this is quite powerful stuff. The, how did you, you have a very balanced um, tone to the film. You just let people reveal themselves in. What seems to me a uni almost across the board a compassionate understanding of the human condition. How did you not fall into the uh, outrageous anger at what some of these people stupid say. and nasty things that some of these people would say with genuine smiles and right. hearts on their sleeves? Sure, I guess it's the sort of filmmaker in me that's like, okay, they're saying these things and they're revealing themselves, mm -hmm. and that's going to make a good film as opposed to what my own personal sort of opinion is about it. Um, and you want that revelation, you know, you want that truth on screen. And, you know, that's what you sort of, yeah, that's what you work towards. Do you have any mentoring uh, on this project? And if so, who were the filmmakers that you looked to? Or sure. Who? Yeah, I mean, there's always mentoring on, on projects. I worked with... Um, Stanley Nelson and the Firelight. Uh, he has a his company has a mentorship program for mm -hmm. uh, filmmakers of color. He was instrumental on my last film and this film. Um, my producer Yvonne Welbin, uh, who is a, an esteemed director in her own right. Um, she did I don't know if you uh, Ruth Ellis at oh, Living yes, yes. with Pride mm -hmm. and, and and Sisters in Cinema and, and um, not only a is she my producer but a mentor as well. Um, 
and you know, and then also too, I was so lucky to have such great um, opportunity at like the Sundance Producers Lab, mm -hmm. um, at Tribeca All Access, um, with Chicken and Egg, another funding that funds women filmmakers that gives mentorship. Um, you know, making a film, a documentary film, is a really, I believe it's a total collaborative process. Was it process. your producer? I mean, you do have almost every resource that's available for a person of color to make a film. They all seem to have lined up and supported you. Yeah. How did that happen? I think... This is for other filmmakers. Yeah, right? no, totally. You know, I think it was a timing issue. Again, the politics were happening as I was making this film, and so people saw that there was this was the time for a film like this. Mm -hmm. So that had the only reason I had to do with that is because I had a sense in 2008 that this was going to be a, a big thing. Um, I also think it's you know I've been I've been working in the business now for a number of years, more like almost 15 years. Um, we've. And so, uh, you know, you make connections, you're apply it's a lot of applying for grants. There's a lot I didn't get to, you know, there's always that. Um, but it's, you know, a networking and, um, you know, I would say to, to younger filmmakers, you really have to know how to express yourself on paper uh, in order to get that, the, the funding to, to, to do the work, mm -hmm. um, be persistent. Is that a mentoring situation also? In terms of? Of uh, someone actually critiquing and helping the Yes, people. absolutely, absolutely, uh, definitely. So you look to the people that have been successful and reach out to them? Right, I mean, on these grants, you know, I have, I've written enough grants that, not that I don't need you know another I but I've written enough grants that you know I sort of know how to write a grant but when I first started for sure you know you have to learn how to write these proposals you know we just got the signal that we have to yes. finish this interview uh, and I would love to talk to you for hours at a time but I'm going to ask you one question is yes. I would like you to talk to the potential audience of this film who thinks they may know this story and yeah. they don't need to go see it I think that what this film reveals and what the audience response has been is that we are seeing um, that you see and understand uh, black LGBT folks of color and what the sort of intersectionality of race and, and sexuality and also it, organizing how you can win a, a, an issue um, and what it means to organize with our own community and the diversity of voices within our own community. One last question. The gospel singer who yeah, came totally. out. Uh, how is he doing now? He is um, working. He has changed his sort of persona. He now goes by B. Slade. But he's recording. He's producing. So his career uh, is still intact. His career is, he's, he's building a new career. Okay. He's not in the gospel world. He's okay. building a new career. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. It's a pleasure.